rainy day. So Rianne has joined with us. She's going to be our speaker for today for Discover the Truth Behind Cat Behavior. Before we start, thank you so much everybody for attending today. Um, we do want to let you know that we'll start off with a quick introduction with Rianne herself. Um, and we'll move on to about 20 minutes of her talking about some of her experiences, some interesting catness that um, she can help clarify. And then we'll move on to the live Q&A session, which we're the most excited about. So thank you so much for those who have submitted some questions in advance. So we'll be starting with those. And then when the live Q&A session starts, which we will tell you when that is, you can start to submit your questions. Um, and there will be an upvoting section for you to be able to give a thumbs up to the ones that you're really interested in. Um, and then that will move to the top of the queue and then we can help answer those for you. Uh, just to let you know as well that this webinar is being recorded and we will share it on our social media channels afterwards on Instagram and Facebook for other viewers who are interested in seeing uh, this webinar afterwards. Um, and throughout, there will be a poll as well, uh, just to make this session a little bit more interactive, not like your usual webinar, um, so that you can all tune on on that and that would be fantastic to hear uh, some of the information you have to give us. So let's get started. Um, I want to let you know that Brianne is actually also a duty manager at Lifelong Animal Protection Charity, uh, which has been around for 20 years. It started in 2003. Um, so they're a no-kill charity organization that help to rescue animals, um, help with the human-animal bonding. They do a lot of projects as well. Um, and you can see that the kittens in this photo were recently um, adopted. Uh, by a really sweet woman as they were found in a plastic bag by a bin and we'll have a little bit more stories on that later. So if you're interested in lifelong animal protection, please do follow them on social media and they're most up to date on Instagram and Facebook to hear their stories. Um, Brianne, let's get started. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Absolutely. Thank you, Vera. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brianne, and I'm super happy to be sharing this time with everyone here today. I understand it's a large group. That's wonderful. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me, Vera? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Good. So if there are any questions or thoughts that come up to you as I'm talking, just like Vera, Vera said, we definitely have a lot of things to talk about. There's a Q&A at the end, so save it to then. There's always so much more to cover than we have time. So will we leave that to the end? Well, let's get going. We're here because we love cats. We're interested in feline behavior from most of us here today is because we love them and we wanna be the best caregivers we can be. And cat behavior is fascinating. It's undergone some really deep studies in the past decade, but there is still so much to learn. And their behaviors can really seem kind of difficult or confusing to understand. So if you break down the math, math here, we always love math. This is easy though. Cats were domesticated 4,000 years ago. Sounds like a long time, but compare that to dogs. Dogs were domesticated maybe 14,000 years ago compared to 4,000. That's a lot of development still left to do. That's kind of why I feel like cats are much closer to their African cat genetic heritage. And they still, have a lot of, they still have a lot of that instinctual drive that's helped them to survive and adapt for so long. It's that same drive what most of us both love about the cat and what can cause the most distress for us as humans, human owners. And, and it's what's created a lot of the myths and misinterpretations we're gonna talk about today. Now then, who am I? And why do I think this work is important? Well, I started out as a teenager looking to save the world. I ran boats with a group called Greenpeace back in the day and was gonna help every creature and every tree and teach people about the environment. And as a 20 year old, I got lured into the lights and potential fame of Hollywood. And I forgot that I was gonna save the world. Until one day we were working with an orangutan. We were teaching him human things like smoking a cigar for a movie and I remember looking at the orangutan and just seeing emptiness in his eyes, not because he wasn't intelligent by far, they're amazing creatures. It was like he was empty of spirit and not even vibrant anymore. And I thought, this is awful. I'm not doing anything I wanted to do with my life. So I left and I started working in education departments at zoos and wildlife rehab centers, doing kind of presentations for schools and stuff like we're doing right now. 
it was wonderful and it was reinvig reinvigorating. So I stuck with cats because I just kind of understand them. I know how to help them trust me and to be contented in this really crazy human world we're always throwing them in. I am where I am now because I found that cats have the most fascinating behaviors to understand. I think the complex complexity of it is what really drives me. I do this work today because just in the United States alone, 3.2 million cats go into shelters every year and 860,000 of them are euthanized. 42% of the cats in homes are either sent to shelters, abandoned, or they're just given away because of possible behavior problems. That's almost 50%. I do the work I do because so many cats are euthanized or just abandoned because, because the behaviors their owners don't like might easily have been helped. So today, let's talk about some of those behaviors, some of the myths and truths that we all hear. There are so many more than any other animal, and it's, it's just crazy, because dogs have tons of studies about them. Behavioral studies on felines really have only come to birth in the past maybe decade. This, for this talk, we're going to expand on three misunderstood aspects of cats that seem to be the ones I've come across most within my work. The first one, this is a big one. Cats don't like other cats. They're solitary, they like to be left alone. They don't like any other animal. We all hear this, cats don't get along and they just wanna be left alone. If anyone has ever had the chance to observe a cat colony, feral cats living in a community, you will know this is far from true and if you haven't had a chance, you should get involved in it. It's wonderful to watch them in their, I say natural environment in the wild. Their system of social structure could only exist with animals designed to function as social beings. They have a perfectly intricate set of body language that speaks volumes to other cats. It tells each other what they're feeling at any given moment, and they also have a really strong olfactory sense or sense of smell, and that tells them who they know and who they don't know. This is by far their strongest indicator of safety and security, the familiarity of smells. With this, these cat social groups learn to survive not as solitary individuals, but as a colony. They live in clusters around food and their shelter, and studies now show that cats even find other cats that they prefer. They have cat buddies, and they'll spend their days near them, grooming, sharing the rearing of the babies. In other words, they like other cats. Hunting, though, hunting is the only true solitary thing they do. Unlike dogs, we all know they hunt in packs. Cats only hunt alone. If you've ever tried to watch, a, a, I don't know, if you have house cats in the wild in the US, I had my cats on a farm, so I got to observe them. They would get annoyed if the other cat got involved. So, and, and that will say they'd like to, uh, they like to definitely be solitary. But do they actually like us humans? That's the question we want to know. Do they like being around us? After listening to many cat owners and non-cat people talk about this, I kind of believe that much of this unsocial cat stereotype may have come from a couple of things. One thing, there's this human perception of what we, we believe is the way a social creature should act like. Cats are unique and they're much more subtle or quiet about how they're feeling. It can take hours upon days upon years of watching cats sometimes watching them interact before we finally see oh wow there's like a ton of conversation going on right now i i never really noticed the way my cat's eyes are, are moving and looking around or their tails or their ears are twitching it seems so simple but it is complex and wonderful and a birth of information cats might really be enjoy being in the room with you or just sitting next to you on the couch what they might not do is show you that they like you by jumping in your lap and wagging their tails like a dog would. They're subtle and they're conservative with their actions. Second thing, as with most of cat behavior, much of the cat's inclination towards being more social with other cats, with other species, really has to do with how they were socialized as kittens. This is super important and why I and many of the cat care advocates really focus on not buying from pet shop style breeders. A kitten needs time with mom and siblings to learn how to feel confident as a cat. 
Readers take kittens away from the litter during that really sensitive period, we say from four to eight weeks, before they get a chance to learn how to interact as that social creature that we want them to be, with all the proper mannerisms that, that help them to adapt to a changing human world. Mom and other cats have to teach them how to act properly as a cat, which means learning how to react and to respond to other cats and to their environment in a well-behaved manner. If they don't learn those skills, they will not survive long in a colony. This applies to being a well-behaved house cat as well, learning how to figure out your environment and, and making that environment feel safe. So as far as wondering, does your cat like being around you? There's the question. Let's answer that now. So there was this great study I read at Oregon State University, again in the United States. It shows when an average mix of domestic cats strays, well-bred, all kinds of domestic cats were presented with several categories of stimuli, including human social interaction, food, toys, and scent, the smell of things, that the majority, 50% of cats preferred interaction with humans, followed next by food at 37%, then toys were 11%, and finally scent 2%. There you go, cats like us. We don't have to worry anymore, right? We can be happy. Okay, moving <laughs> on to the second myth. This is, oh, this is the fun one. Okay, this one I hear so much. Okay, second thing, and there's a poll going around right now. Cats are not like dogs. Cats are not trainable. Everybody listening, here is where I start saying the one thing that will blow your mind. You will never be the same again once I tell you this. Cats are not dogs. <laughs> Did everyone hear that? Cats are not dogs. There's a secret. This webinar is over, we can all go home. <laughs> I hope at least one person's smiling out there. Okay, so the number of times I hear someone say, ah, why won't my cat come to me when I call them like a dog does? Why won't my cat learn to sit like a dog does? Why won't my cat come and greet me and my guests when I open the door like a dog does? I can't tell my cat even likes me because they don't wag their tail like a dog does. And why is that? Because cats are not dogs. Now, seriously, this is where I want to talk briefly, try to keep it as brief as I can, about how cats are not like dogs feline communication, and, and what cats need. So in order to approach training cats and understanding why they're doing what they're doing, you really have to dig into how and why they communicate. A huge subject that I'm gonna to try to talk about kind of briefly. Dogs and humans, we kind of speak the same language. What I mean by that is dogs and humans have comparable familiar bonds and social systems, we both also look for feedback in a similar manner. If I do this thing, I get approval. If I do this other thing, I don't get, a, get approval. Cats, on the other hand, they do not need our approval. Approval isn't even a part of their social needs. What do they need? They need to know that they are able to survive. This means they feel safe from harm, have food, have shelter. This is just a very basic need of most animals, so let me quickly add to this before it seems like I don't think cats like us. There's more to it than just that. Cats learn to respond to and to like being around the people that give them all of these things, all the things that they need. Once those needs are covered, the cat can relax and then they can be free to seek out the other comforts, such as being pet, getting groomed, being playful, being cuddly, then they can be relaxed enough to stroll through your human world in a really positive way. How do you train a cat? If they don't like approval, what do you do then? So I'm gonna lay out uh, some simple thoughts. I really wanna emphasize that with most of cat training and behavior, cats do not respond to punishment. In fact, it makes them more likely to be stressed and more likely to continue the behaviors you don't like. Using a spray bottle, that's what I was first taught to do. You don't want your cat doing something, you spray them. Or you, you make noise or you do things that actually just stresses them out and the cat really has no 
way of associating disapproval. So they don't know what's going on except that they're getting more irritated. Punishment does not work with cats. Cats do respond to positive reinforcement actually very, very, very well. To train a cat, let me see if I can keep this brief again, to train a cat, you make the thing that you don't want them to do unattractive and you make what you want them to do attractive. It is very, very simple. It sounds simple until you're trying to work with your cat, I know, but I promise it is a very simple concept. Cats, most cats, will work for food. So you find that one thing they love to eat, cheese, a piece of chick chicken, a particular cat treat, and only give that to them when they do what it is you want them to do. Make it a special moment. Some cats can be encouraged by petting, some like playtime as well. So remember to alternate what you do to reward them. Make the cat excited by changing the reward. They won't know what's coming next. So they don't get bored and they don't lose interest. So let me give you an example on the, how this might look like in real life. I have a Siamese, Prudence, and a gray tabby, Poppet. Prudence had started peeing on things if she felt anxious, on the floor, on rugs. I couldn't tell why she was anxious, but I, I knew she was. Why was she feeling this way? Here's the part that I really find fun where you can learn to be a cat detective. Each cat is different. You know what things are happening around the cat when they behave in certain ways. What do they like? What do they respond positive to? What makes them feel anxious? Each cat is going to act and respond to different things than another cat might. So with prudence, after weeks of watching her, I saw it. The reason she was not peeing in her box was because Poppet, my other cat, wouldn't leave her alone when she tried to pee. Poppet would be asleep, but once she heard Prudence scratching in the litter box, she would wake right up, run over to check it out. She would stare at her, sniff at her, hey, what you doing over here? Hey, you're peeing, that's cool. Oh, could I watch you and smell you? Prudence isn't too keen on other cats in general, so this was like touching the Queen of England. She then had to run out and find other places she could hide and pee. Once I discovered this, then I could go at the problem. How do we do that? One, make the thing unattractive. Make the area she was peeing unattractive. I cleaned the area with an enzyme cleaner. You have to get the smell out. Then I covered it with aluminum foil. You can really use Anything that the cat might step on and find unattractive, aluminum foil is easy. We have it in the house. Yeah, it's not pretty. Your, cat, your house might kind of look a little weird while you're dealing with this. So you put aluminum foil down. You could also <laughs> use things like, like an upside down, um, like outdoor mats. If you turn them upside down, there's like a pokey side on the bottom. It's not painful to the cat. It's just distracting. You can put those in the area as well. Something that will make them not want to step there. Two make the area I want her to pee in attractive again. This, of course, had to involve keeping Poppet away. First, I got a cat litter that I feel really works wonderfully with, with cats that have inappropriate elimination issues. I, I like Dr. Esley's brand. It's a scoopable clay sand type, and cats that have problem with litter boxes often really respond to the softer clay sand-like litter. So I put out a third litter box in the area where I could see and I could watch and close it off if pop that might be coming around. I then had to reward not prudence for pain in the litter box. I decided what would seem more logical is I needed to distract and reward Poppet for not going in there to mess with her. So that's how I handled that. It took a while. It involved a few steps and is something I definitely still have to continue to monitor regularly. As with all cat training, I tell people you have to be patient, you have to be understanding. The cat is not trying to punish you. In fact, most of these behavior problems, whether it's peeing or scratching furniture or simply behaviors, felines use to express their normal cat communications. The anxiousness, the anxiety your cat is manifesting with these behavior problems, I believe are actually that a cat with very specific and very well-defined social constructs that have worked for them for thousands of years, 
They're being asked to behave in a world of humans. Our human world has expectations about what we believe our pets should be and should act like. We don't often want our human living quarters to look like an animal lives there with junk piled everywhere and stuff for them to climb over. Unfortunately, mine kind of looks like that, but hey, I'm a cat lady so I can get away with it. Um, so this is, this is a good way of rolling over into talking about anxiety. Anxiety in cats is about 90% of what I personally work with. It's the basis for nearly every problem behavior cats have. Most of what I've already talked about shows a bit of why stress can come about. This is a subject that could take up a whole other webinar. So let me talk about it in conjunction with the importance of enrichment and how to give your cat things they need so this anxiety doesn't have a chance to manifest. I understand that a lot of people might have questions about anxiety, especially now with uh, many of us being home, our cats aren't used to the change and they're not used to you being around. They don't have a lot of quiet time. So I've, heard, I've had a lot of clients right now that have, have come to me for basic anxiety issues. So please feel free to ask more detailed questions about anxiety in our Q&A if you have some thoughts. So indoor cats. They must be provided activities. I cannot emphasize this enough. If you're going to be a cat owner and you do not provide them with the basics, they will be miserable and stressed and you will feel miserable and stressed. No fun for anyone. This is the same no matter the animal. One of my favorite jobs working in zoos was behavioral enrichment because it involved getting to watch the animals constantly and observe how they were in responding to their environment and what could be done to make them feel even better with their environment. Adding peanut butter to holes and tree stumps was something I loved doing. The bears used to love to dig the peanut butter out of tree stumps. Um, I would bury things called mealworms, which sounds kind of gross. It's baby bugs, but mealworms. I would tuck them, tuck them inside of coconuts or inside of fruits and things for the monkeys to pick out. It's a lot of fun doing this with your cat too, figuring out what your cat likes. Toilet paper rolls, my goodness, if you go online and look at what to do with toilet paper rolls for your cats, you'll come up with all kinds of fun things. Again, your house might not look great with toilet paper rolls rolling around everywhere, but there you go, that's cat ownership for you. All right, for cats then, what are the basics? I think there are six things that are the basics. Okay, one. A cat must have an area to have a litter box that is right for them. You need one litter box per cat. I know it's hard when you live in small apartments, but you got to do that to help keep them not stressed and to keep them from peeing everywhere. The location of the litter box needs to feel safe. Cats need to feel like they're not going to be pounced on when they're vulnerable and trying to eliminate. They want to be able to watch as far around their space as possible. If the box is tucked into a corner, or it's covered, the cat might not feel secure in their ability to run if the need arises. So avoid covered litter boxes, especially important with a multi-cat household. And all this is important. If your cat's easy, it doesn't have any litter problems, you can get away with a lot more, but not every cat is going to respond. So if you're starting out, just get a basic, easy, big litter box. It doesn't even have to be fancy. Okay, second thing, a cat must have easy access to food and water, and that food and water should not be in the same place as the litter box. It's even a nice idea to have bowls of water in two different places. Three, a cat must scratch things, get them scratching posts. Unless you wanna use your couch, you're free to use your couch, but I recommend scratching posts. Four, a cat must have things to climb in and out and up to. Cat trees are great. You get a scratching post and you get things for them to climb. Cat shelves, box-like things to hide in. There are a ton of decorative furniture things out there for cats. So your flat doesn't end up looking like mine does. Again, paper everywhere, boxes, cardboard things for them to crawl under. Check places out that have this beautiful cat furniture. Okay, five. A cat must hunt and catch. The catch part is as important as the hunt. They need to feel that satisfaction of sinking their teeth into something. When you play, make sure you also let them catch it sometimes and give them a treat after so it feels closer to that hunt, catch, and eat quality they desire. 
Especially important if you use the laser lights, since there's no real catch part of that game. Give them food after. Many behaviors don't even recommend the light toys, but I think they're great. You just gotta follow up with something tasty that they get that satisfaction of grabbing onto. Six, a cat must have a sense of security. This is where everything comes together. They must feel you are safe. If strange noises and visitors come a lot, help the cat feel this is normal and give them treats, pats, talk to them kindly, play with them, make it a normal part of their everyday experience. Make the litter box safe, make their access to food safe. You have become the mother cat in their lives. It is your job to teach them what is safe and how to react with confidence and calm when things change within their world. They are sensitive. I'm not gonna say they're psychic and get into any of that, but they are very sensitive to our emotions and to our feelings. If you're nervous because somebody comes in, they're gonna wonder what's going on. So it, it helps you. I mean, you get to learn some meditation techniques along with teaching your cat, there you go. So this all goes back to being a cat detective and learning what and how your cats respond to their environment. Many people use cameras in the home so they can watch and learn from the cats. That's kind of fun. And if you feel like you're having stress issues with the cat, having a camera to observe them is a nice idea. So the final, there's a final poll that's gonna be going around. It is a good one um, to have us roll into our Q&A session and maybe for some questions and thoughts you might like to bring up. I would love to hear how you've learned to interpret your own cat's behavior. So if this is a good time, Vera, maybe we can open up for questions now? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've just set up the fourth poll that's going around now of ah. how many cat activities do you provide at home? Um, so we have some people are filling in. They're still, they're still filling in their answers now. Um, so I'll share the results with you just in a second. Um, I think we're done now. So let's have a look. How many cat activities do you provide at home? So let's see, three to four activities at home have garnered the most answers at 43%. So would you say that's um, a, a good amount then, Brianne? I think, I think it's a great amount. As long as they can scratch things, as long as they can climb, yes, it's a great amount. Um, great, thanks. Yeah, this sounds and good. So, um, obviously, the import, this you know is all tied to importance of enrichment, which is what Brianne was talking about um, before as well to keep your cats interactive. Um, just so we could get a show of hands, it'd be really interesting before we get to the Q and A to see how many of you think um, what kind of level of understanding you have of cat behavior, whether it's your cat or cats in general. So there's beginner, uh, intermediate, and advanced, and hopefully Brianne has helped to answer some uh, more of your questions that you might have had earlier, if not in the following session that will be coming up in, in just a few seconds. Um, so what I can see so far, people are still filling in, is quite a lot of people think that they have an, a good understanding at an intermediate level for um, understanding cat behavior. Um, there are a, a few beginners out there at uh, 29%, and intermediate is at 64%, you can see here. Um, and a few at advance. So that's really fantastic that we have some people on here who really, really understand their cats super well. Thank you so much for doing that. So for the live Q&A session that we're going to do now, um, if you haven't already, feel free to submit your questions into the Q&A box. What you can do is if you have some particular questions that other people have submitted, you can give a thumbs up and that will um, move the question up to the top of the queue. Um, but some of you have actually been super proactive and um, submitted your questions in advance for on Facebook discussion. So we'll start with those first to give you a little bit of time for those of you that are live and want to submit the questions by the Q&A chat on Zoom right now. So I'm just going to move over to Facebook so that we can pull this up for Brianne here. Um, and our first one comes from Candice, who says, I have a five-year-old female Berman, and I'm thinking of getting a dog. Would it be better to get a puppy or an adult rescue dog? And are there any particular breeds of dogs that would get on better with a cat? Would a female or a male dog be better? Brianne, do you have any input on that? Yeah, getting a new animal is a challenge with a cat. It's true. Um, if your cat has never seen a dog, 
they may need to have some big adjustments ahead. Um, there are a lot of things online that explain how to introduce animals to each other. Getting a, it's kind of tough because getting a puppy can be nice because the puppy will get used to the cat as, as it grows up, but puppies are also a bit more rowdy and they can totally seem like a monster to a cat that's never seen one. Um, this is one of those common questions that kind of has a few steps to getting it right. Basically, you have to introduce them through closed doors for a good week. Then you add something that smells like the dog to the space where you, you're keeping the cat for about a week again. Then you feed each of them on each side of the door for about a week. Then use a gate, feed them again on each side for about a week. You need a nice, slow introduction. Do not rush it, do not be impatient. It will do wonders for an easier and a more complete potential for them to get along. I can say there is something to do with breeds, but I honestly feel that breeds don't necessarily always fall into some sort of textbook behavior. Basically, if you don't introduce them patiently and properly, it won't matter what breed you have. Um, I hope that answered that question. Thanks, it's uh, Candace. Hopefully that helps answer your question there. Um, she also has a second question. My cat is a really picky eater. She doesn't like to eat out of a bowl, even though she has a doctor cat, these cat bowls for whiskers relief. She prefers to eat off the floor. She's on a raw diet, still in cheese, very tasty for those of you uh, that don't know this brand. Um, it's freeze dry, she rehydrates it with tasty bone broth. I've tried food toppers, but it doesn't seem to help. Do you have any further advice for this? So what I'm understanding is she's, she will eat off of the floor, but, is just kind of picky about how she eats. Is that how I'm hearing that, I think? Yeah, I'm reading it here. Sorry, bad glasses. Okay. Cats and picky eating. This, you kind of have to experiment with types of food. I think, so there's this thing called sensitive whiskers that happens a lot with cats. It can sometimes be even painful if their whiskers touch the sides of bowls. So she might be eating off the floor because she has sensitive whiskers. Um, use a flat dish. Don't use a bowl that she has to stick her head into. Um, moist food is a lot easier for them to lick up rather than bite. It sounds like the kind of food you're giving them. I mean, the raw food is, is tremendous. Um, so I honestly, for that, I would just say try feeding her in a flat bowl. Obviously, she wants to eat off the floor. So it might be a sensitive whisker issue. How's that? Got it, thank you. Um, and so we're gonna move on to some other ones. Sorry, I just skipped one over here, so I'm just gonna scroll back. Um, so uh, this girl says, I have an eight month old ragdoll, Ginny, with my five year old dog, Coco. Ginny likes Coco and always wants to play with her, but she's a kitten and she recently joined my dog, so my dog is jealous. My dog is mixed breed, but we had her since she was a puppy, around three months old at the time, and I still had my previous, two previous cats, Ragdoll and Norwegian Forest Cat, who were just over 10 years old at the time, and the dog knew that the cats were here first, so she knew her place. They coexist peacefully for past six years until both the cats passed away a few months ago, so sorry. Um, my previous Ragdoll girl was kind of a princess as she was number one in the house, so she would let Coco know not to mess with her, but Coco was scared. Now Coco bullies my new cat, Jenny, because she's new. I think it's better when the cat is already there in the household first, so the new dog would know its place. Good luck. I suggest getting a pet gate to separate them at first for a few weeks and feed them separately. A puppy is probably best in case your cat has never seen a dog before and may get anxious. Oh, so this was really you know, helpful advice from this girl there. Um, yeah, so okay. hopefully this is a, a good addition to, to Candace's a um, few questions that she had earlier. We're gonna move on now to Allison. Um, my cat Doris is a one-year-old rescue whom I've had for about six weeks. She's just started a new behavior. Whenever I lie in bed, she crawls up and starts kneading my shoulder or any other exposed skin on my chest. Yeah. And when that hurts too much mm -hmm. and I move her, she goes up to my head and needs my hair, sometimes chewing it. I wake up with huge knots which is why is she doing this and why only when I'm in bed, not on the couch or anywhere else. She won't sit in my lap, another needable place, only when I'm lying down. That's interesting. The, the particularness of it is interesting. So I have um, a 
just personally, I had, I had a male cat that had sucking issues. They call it a uh, wool sucking. They, they, for whatever reason, as a kitten, they just never received the satisfaction of staying with their mother long enough to get over the need to nurse. So a lot of this has to do with the need to nurse. He would be on my face, he would sleep on my neck, and he would need and suck to both my husband and I. And he, he did it his, his whole life. There wasn't a lot I could do about it, except honestly, I kept putting him off. It's a sense of security. I did end up making him a, uh, a thing from terry cloth, you know, like, like things out of towels. I basically sewed a piece of terry cloth together, stuffed things in it, and the feeling of the terry cloth was very satisfying, and it's a lot like nursing on mother's tummy. So you can take that, you can put it next to you whenever the cat's starting to do it, just kind of put the cat onto this. And it worked, I mean, it worked with my other cat most of the time, but sometimes he would just, the need to be near me would be so great that he would end up doing it again. So I recommend making some kind of thing out of a, out of a terry cloth or a towel material that he can, I'm sorry, that she can suck on and, and, and need as she needs to. As far as why she does it when you're in bed, honestly, my cat did the same thing. I think your mood changes, you get much more relaxed, you're settled down, and, it, and to the cat, that's like, oh, good. We're all gonna just settle down now and be cozy. But even when I'm on the couch, I'm usually doing something. I'm usually fiddling with my phone or I'm moving or I'm getting up to get a drink of water. So the cat never feels like I can settle down for a long period of time. But when you're in bed, they can't. And so they, they tend to be a lot more needing and nursing when you're in bed. Thanks, and do you think that the terry cloth will help as well if she wants to you know, help um, so she can pick up her cat and, and, and sit in her, her lap a little bit more? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, there you go, Allison. Um, so from Jackie, I have a seven-year-old cat who loved my daughter. She got married six years ago and has two children, and now my cat absolutely despises her whole family. All they have to do is open the door and she starts hissing, and if they get close, she tries to swipe at them. She's never hissed at anyone else. She has even cornered my daughter when I leave the room. What can I do to help the situation? Okay, when a cat doesn't like a certain person, Somewhere along the way, the cat decided something about that person is wrong for them. Even if they liked them at one point, something happened. And, it, and again, because cats are subtle and they can't communicate, we wouldn't know what that was necessarily. It could have been a simple loud noise that happened at the same time that this person, that your daughter was interacting with the cat, maybe being pet in an uncomfortable way, anything that might have triggered a problem for the cat. So what I recommend, you kind of reintroduce the person in the same way that you would reintroduce a new animal. Start by taking that person's clothes, start by taking your daughter's clothing, socks, nice, fun, smelly things like that, putting them with the cat at the same time, giving the cat treats, giving the cat positive encouragement, letting the cat know that this is a good smell. Cats are olfactory. That's how they really start to bond with another animal, with their environment, with everything. They've really got to associate that smell first. So let her start smelling the clothing. Have that person set calmly. Have, have, your, cat, have your daughter set calmly on the floor. Put treats next to her for the cat to, to grab. This may take a few weeks, so be patient. Be calm the whole time. Make sure you do it in a way that they're not going to suddenly be interrupted with loud noises or anything that's gonna make the cat feel a little off. Thank you. Um, so I just want to chime in that uh, we're noticing the time is uh, 12 15 right now. So yeah, what yeah, we're yeah. gonna do is we're gonna try and uh, get through the questions as, as fast as we can. Um, we're also trying, you know, even it out a little bit so we can ask some questions from the actual Q&A as, as well as on Facebook. So I am going to jump between the two now just to let you know. Um, so we have one here. Hi, I'm a 100% new beginner for kittens and cats. I've never had any pets before and I've adopted an eight week old kitten and will be picking him up on Monday. How do I educate my eight week old kitten to be a cuddly loving lap cat? Is this personality related, Brianne? What do you think? Because I think you can pick up any stray that's living on the street and make them a happy cat, just like a rag doll cat can, can be a happy cat. I really, I don't buy into breeds being the perfect choice necessarily. So any cat can be a loving, cuddly cat if they're treated right. It's wonderful that this is an eight-week-old kitten. You have tons of time. So how do you get them to sit on your lap? 
give them treats, make it positive. Don't force a cat to do anything. Let the cat come to you. Maybe you're sitting on the floor. Start by sitting on the floor rather than the couch. Sit on the floor, put cat treats beside you, play with them, pull the toy over you. Anything that's going to make the cat eventually realize, oh, your lap's fun too. I like the lap. Many cats just respond to laps immediately, but some cats don't, so make it positive. And, and again, don't force, never force a cat to do anything. Make it positive. Okay. Thank you. Um, and another one, my cat sometimes poops outside of his litter box, even though we have two litter boxes for him that are, are cleaned regularly, what's going on. I think this kind of ties in a little bit with what you mentioned before about where you don't want them to pee, where you want them to pee. But is there anything you might want to add to that? It's, I really think you, you need, my, my favorite kind of litter boxes are the ones that have a short front side and three really tall back sides. My prudence uh, tends to pee outside of the box, even though she's in the litter box also. I've had to put up a, um, a pee pad behind it just because she misses, she's a little older. So I think it's, a, it's and getting her a big litter box made a lot of difference. So I really think the ones that have high sides can help the cat not not go, but I, I'm guessing this, this cat actually like sets there and poops outside the litter box. Um, try changing the litter out, try moving the litter box, anything that might, uh, just watch the cat and see why they might be doing that. But yeah, new litter, new litter box. Besides just cleaning the litter box, maybe get a new one. Okay, um, and also he likes to chew on threads, so we can't leave him alone with towels and sweaters. How can I help him stop? Distract him. Um, this is, it's tough because you're not always going to be there, but mm. you want to catch, when an animal is doing something, when a cat's doing something you don't want them to do, you don't, it's best to catch them before, like right before the thing happens rather than as it's happening and just distract him from, give him something that he would prefer to do. Again, make what you don't want them to do negative and make what, the, what you want them to do positive. So distract him, give him a treat before he, he goes at it. Um, mm -hmm. You might just have to, I had a cat that looked photo, old photographs and, and no matter what I did, she just liked the taste of old photographs. So cats, <laughs> cats are just peculiar. You just have to make their environment safe in the best way that you can. Great, thank you. Um, we have an interesting one here. My cat cries a lot whenever we go to bed. Does it mean he doesn't want to be left alone and how do we solve this problem? Okay, um, a cat's howling at night is very common. I rec usually, I say they're bored, but bored's too generic. They need to burn off some energy. Play with them right before you go to bed. And what I mean play, like 15 minutes of really, really hard interactive play. Not that it's going to make them sleep, but it's going to make them feel content. Like, oh, I'm satisfied. I just hunted, now I can settle down. The cat probably is just, just needs some more stimulation. Um, and if you close your door, maybe try opening the bedroom door so that they, they have you there. Uh, the, the cat's just not feeling very confident and it's, and it's kind of, it's, it needs some stimulation and it's not feeling very confident. So play with it, play with your cat, good three times a day, 15 minutes, but especially right before you go to bed. That will start to help with that. Thanks. Okay, and the, and the following one is, um, my cat gets so anxious from any noise outside of my apartment, such as neighbors mm -hmm. talking, cars driving, and even this morning thunder, that was very loud. Um, how can I help her? This is called desensitizing an animal. You wanna make them get used to any kind of noises and know that it's safe. So when these noises are happening, do positive things with the cats. Give the cats their favorite food, give them treats, play with them. It's like, hey, no problem, we're just playing here. It's just a noise, but while that noise is going on, we're gonna have a good time and we're gonna play. It takes a long time. One of those things that takes a lot of patience. Even when the noises aren't going around, maybe you can simulate it just to, uh, just to make this happen more often. Do it about three times a day, five times a day. Give them noisy things to deal with as you're training them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think this, this one might be um, a fairly common one, perhaps. One of my cats keeps spraying on my quilt, either in me or old. What, what's happening? What's going on? Okay. If the quilt is on the bed, that cat is doing it because that's where you are and it's not because they don't like you, it's actually the reverse. It's actually because they like you very much and they're missing you for some reason. 
that's a very general way of answering it. There might be more to it, but often the cat's just feeling like they aren't getting the attention from you that they want. And so they're trying to, to claim, oh, at least there's this little bit of her that I still like. So how to, how to deal with that? Give the cat a lot of attention. Let the cat know that it feels safe. Um, and you're going to need to retrain the cat to not go on, the, go on your bed. So if you can get like a tarp that you would use to cover outside, use that to get, cover your bed in the meantime while you're training your cat or while you're uh, interacting with the cat in a positive way to discourage it from ever wanting to get on there. Again, your house isn't gonna look good, but at least the cat for the time being won't be peeing on your bed. So cover the bed and then give your cat a lot of positive interaction at the other times of the day. That's a really big question, so there's a lot to that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and this one says, why does my cat sometimes scratch my leg to get attention and not scratch other people? Um, how can I stop this? I'm wondering at some point if, when the cat was a kitten, if you've had this cat since a kitten, they got positive reinforcement for it, for either a pet, anything, anything that means they got attention for doing it. Even if they got negative attention, it's still attention. So you're going to want to ignore the cat. You're gonna watch the cat before, like you probably know the signs already. Oh, my cat's getting ready to call my, call, call my legs. Don't let it happen. Cut it before it ever happens. Walk away, pull yourself away from the situation. Then when the cat is calm and not scratching your leg, give the cat treats for not doing it. So you kind of have to catch them just before they're doing it. Somewhere along the way, the cat decided that it was a positive thing. And now you have to make it a negative thing, not by punishing, but by distracting them, pulling your energy away. Don't give them any attention whatsoever. Walk away. And when they stopped, give them a treat. Thanks. Um, and another one here. We adopted an eight-month-old female kitten. We already have 16 and 18 year old males and she wants to play and bite them all the time. They want to sleep. What can we do to assimilate them, them all? They're older, they probably do just want to sleep and they have a, a, a kitten. I'm, I'm not sure if they are getting along or if it's just the cats want to sleep. Um, if they're all getting along while they're sleeping or, or, or in this situation, and it's not such a bad thing if it's if it's causing stress with the other cats, then you might just need to play with that kitten separately so it burns off some energy and make their interaction like feed them all together, feed them treats where they're all three together, nice and calm. Um, great, thanks. So um, we're going to ask one more question. Unfortunately, we're running out of time today. Um, but I think, you know, with the overwhelming response we've had from everybody here, um, you would be really interesting to hold another uh, webinar so that we can um, get your questions answered. Um, so I'm going to move on to this uh, last one here. Why do cats make a digging motion or trying to pull the edges of the water bowl fountain before they drink water? I have two cats, but only one of them does that. Okay, um, cats, I mean, cats, just like any other animal, their natural, some of their, some of their natural wild natures come out. So they're going to scratch, they're going to scratch for food, they're going to scratch for water. Um, it's, I wish I had a quick and easy answer for that one, because that one, I think cats kind of just, just do it. It's, it's, it's honestly just, they're trying to, so if the, if the water bowl's moving, I do know one thing. Moving water is much more attractive to animals. So if they're hitting the water bowl and the water's moving, then it's more exciting to them. That's why cat water fountains are so great to use. Highly recommend them. So maybe if it's causing you distress that the cat's doing this, get one of the, the flowy water fountains. They're a lot of fun and the cats can play with the water all they want without scratching at the floor. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to... Um start finishing this webinar up now. Um, thank you so much. I think that it's been really interesting having Brianne on with us today. Um, and we would definitely love to hear about what more topics you'd like to hear about so that we can keep bringing you some more interesting content um, and some more webinars. Um, so we're, we're gonna conclude the session for today. Actually, if any of you are interested in reaching out to her directly um, for help with your own cats, what you can do is reach out to her um, at her website or via email. So this would be um, at catconsultant.com, hkcatconsultant, 
um, so I'll bring this up for you here now so that you can actually um, take a look and jot it down if you'd like to um, so you can see this is her email address catlady dot brianne at gmail.com don't forget the g there uh, it's irish spelling isn't that right brianne that's correct yes yes um and then obviously if any of you have information about lifelong animal protection it could be volunteer work or um any questions um just about their cats in general um that you might be interested in, if you're fostering or adopting as well then you can reach out to them there and follow them on social media um and any questions directly you can also send it to my software at the bottom here um in order to submit any of the interesting topics for more content you'd like to hear about there is a really quick one minute survey right at the end of this it would be fantastic if you could fill that in um otherwise you can reach out to me directly below as well like i mentioned before um and feel free to um keep submitting your questions and onto the discussions chat so we will be lining this up and making a record of all of the questions that you've asked as well uh, for those that haven't been answered we hope to hold another webinar for you on this Brianne, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, everyone. This was wonderful. Stay safe in the rain, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Yes. Good night. Good day. <laughs>